for the presence of liquid water on the surface, meaning having temperature that is high enough that can sustain liquid water on the surface, and at the same time, uh, eventually how our planet got an oxygen rich atmosphere that could support life. We need to understand carbon cycle now. Now, if you Google the term carbon cycle, you will come up with a picture, something like this, where carbon is exchanged between the near surface reservoirs of our planet, from hydrosphere to biosphere to atmosphere. Uh, and in this type of carbon cycle, uh, carbon is exchanged, uh, the fluxes, meaning how much carbon is exchanged from one reservoir to another per unit time. If I represent that with the two numbers here, those fluxes are in the order of 10 to the power 14 grams of carbon per unit. And the reservoir size is, meaning if I say, oh, how much carbon is present in hydrosphere, how much carbon is present in soil, how much carbon is present in atmosphere, those reservoir sizes are on the order of 10 to the power 17 grams of carbon. If you do the ratio of the flux and the reservoir size, what you come up with is the average residence time of carbon in this superficial carbon cycle. Meaning, how much time a single carbon atom is spending in any of the reservoirs that have been involved in this cycle. So, this residence time for the short, this carbon cycle is in the ratio, as you can see. This is in the order of 100 to 1000 years at most. So, meaning, here, the carbon is transferring from one reservoir to another relatively fast. That's why we call this carbon cycle short term carbon cycle. So it's operating kind of in human terms here. However, as it turns out, there is yet another carbon cycle that operates in our planet, where carbon is exchanged between the interior reservoirs of our, of our planet, like the mantle of our planet, and the surface reservoirs of our planet, where carbon gets degassed from the mantle to the outside, in the, where we are standing by volcanism at different centers, like volcanism at Indonesian bridges, volcanism at intraplate ocean islands, volcanism at uh, unfractured boundaries, and carbon is also input back into the mantle by tectonic cycles, by rock cycles, by subduction. So in this type of cycle, uh, the fluxes are again on the order of 10 to 30 grams of carbon per year. Very similar to the fluxes uh, I showed you in the short term carbon cycle. However, the reservoir sizes in this case are much larger. Although carbon is only present in the mantle of our planet uh, as trace gases or trace quantities, only a few hundreds to maximum around a thousand million CO2. But because the mantle size is so large, total amount of carbon in the mantle is actually significant, much larger than any of the near surface reservoirs. So in this case, if you do the ratio of these numbers, you come up again with the residence time. But in this case, as you can see, the residence time will be hundreds of millions of years or almost up to a billion years. So that's why we call this carbon cycle long-term carbon cycle. So it's a slow exchange of carbon between the interior and the surface. Uh, just one aside, I will mention that the volcanic CO2 flux that we observe in this carbon, uh, this long-term carbon cycle is two orders of magnitude less than the CO2 emission by artificial carbon cycle. So of course you may be uh, reading a lot about uh, you know, the anthropogenic you know, cause of CO2 increasing in the atmosphere and how that, how that is a big problem and so on. I just point out that volcano is not causing that. Well, volcano cannot cause that in short term time scale because that operates in a slower pace. So, in this long term carbon cycle, this is one area where the inner portions of our planet starts to communicate with the outer reservoir. Right? That's where you can really bring in multiple aspects of geosciences together. Uh, in order to understand this long term carbon cycle, the part that is, in my mind, most essential is the subduction zones. Because this is the part where our planet is unique. Because we don't know any other planets up to this point that has a uh, conventional mode of the tectonics, right? And this is the process by which we can put carbon back into the mantle by subducting sediments, ocean crust, and the mantle with the ocean of our planet. Uh, so carbon can be present as carbon decaying sediments or organic sediments. Carbon can be present in the form of um, altered carbonate grains or vesicles in, in the soils. There could be carbonation of the seafloor, uh, exposed terrific type of the seafloor, and subtraction of all of these technologies into the mantle can introduce carbon into the mantle. Right? That's the ingassing of carbon into the mantle. Uh, if you look at the present day mass fluxes of carbon through this type of subtraction cycle processes, uh, oceanic metallosols represent the most dominant reservoir of moving carbon into the mantle, followed by natural ecosphere and organic and carbonate sediments are relatively minor of both because they need to vary from one subduction to another. So, in order to 
understand what is the fate of carbon as it's going down into the mantle through uh, recycling of crustal reservoirs or, or mantle gooseberry reservoirs. We need to be studying the behavior of each of these ecologies with carbon being present in them and ask ourselves that as those rocks are heated up, as they are going uh, into the mantle, what, what happens to carbon in them? Like, is the carbon getting out through some decarbonation reactions or decarbonization reactions or melting, or is carbon going to be stable? If carbon is going to be stable, then carbon can be put into the natural beam. If the carbon is not stable in some fashion zone environment, then CO2 will be released to other right? That's kind of the framework. Now, how do we get a sense of the carbon mass balance in some fashion zone? One of the ways we get that, we mean the broadest geochemical community, is to apply some, some sort of an inverse or observational approach. In this approach, what has been done is people would try to estimate how much carbon subtracts by looking at uh, concentration of carbon in different mythologies that are uh, undergoing subductions in different subduction zones, and then by also monitoring the steel pump flux at different arc volcanoes and just by comparing the two numbers. If this number is similar to this number, then the idea would be in subduction zone the carbon cycle is in steady state, in how much carbon is going down. Same amount of carbon is coming out. Uh, on the other hand, what we actually observe in the present day is subduction input is actually larger. So this is the one to one line. Um, so the subduction input, subduction input is larger than the hard output. So based on this inverse approach at the present day, many researchers have concluded that at least in subduction zone, carbon cycle is not in balance. More carbon is going down into the mantle than coming out through. So the question is, is the peak carbon cycle in the state? However, you want to really address that question, you shouldn't only be looking at volcanoes and subduction zones, you should be looking at pretty gas in other centers like Hiroshima, which is interplane volcanoes as well. So that's not a topic I'm getting into today. What I want to do though is to point out that this inverse approach does have some shortcomings. Because in this inverse approach, you may be missing some potential fluxes that are hard to construct. For example, uh, what about the flux of uh, carbon out of the four arcs? So, meaning all the carbon that is going in, if you track only the carbon coming out through arc volcanism, you may be missing some carbon coming out of the four arcs, so much volcanism and so on. There may be also storage in the mantle edge uh, or in the overhanging lake. So, meaning carbon may be going in and may be ending up out of the slab, but not all of that carbon may be coming out through our components. So again, that inverse approach of measuring our emission and input of carbon may not be very more nuanced uh, aspect of the carbon cycle. Similarly, the hard flux may be contributed by upper plate, and, and actually one part of my talk I'll make a, make a point that that may have been important in some of the geological history of our planet. Uh, and the release of carbon from the subducting slabs into the wedge may also take place not just directly between the arc volcano, but may be somewhat deeper over a range of them. So again, that may be hard to monitor just by measuring some particular volcano in, in some fashion. So inverse approach uh, has uh, some of these challenges. So because of all these, what the community also does, uh, basically people like us in our group, what we would do is to apply some sort of a forward approach. So the forward approach means instead of looking at how much carbon is going in and how much is coming out at arcs, we will try to actually observe the fate of carbon bearing mythologies in subduction zones by modeling them. And we can, when I say modeling them, it may be through experiments in the lab, or it may be through uh, thermal dynamic modeling. Many of you are familiar with the thermal or particle waves, and so on, right? So those can also be applied to figure out what is the fate of uh, carbon in subduction zones. And in, when you are doing that, Um, I'll just use the So, if you get this forward approach, what you uh, need or what you get out, uh, the parameters that you need to do this are things like stability of carbon bearing minerals, uh, such as carbonates or organics, graphite or carbon, solubility of carbon in different uh, slab derived fluids or milk, how much carbon may be mobilized through, uh, through those slab derived agents. We also need to know thermal structure of subduction zones, meaning how hot does the slab get as a function of temperature. So, you know, 
fundamental concepts of program metamorphism and so on. So nothing, nothing fancy, it's actually the core concepts. But those we can apply to figure out the fate of carbon in uh, So let me just now dive in and give you one summary slide of what is our understanding of the nature of incasting and outcasting in subcaction zones through the phenomenal of our planet. Of course, subcaction zones are different, but what is the average uh, outlook that we can get by taking this kind of forward approach? So this is a summary plot, which is almost 10 years old now, um, where I was showing you temperature on the x-axis increasing to the right, pressure on the y-axis increasing downward, parallel in depth, meaning going up and pressure is increasing. What I have in this plot are the solid lines, where the solid lines represent different experimental or modeling studies where researchers are trying to constrain the decarbonation or carbonate melting boundaries of downgoing carbonate bearing metal salts. So if you sum up the carbonate bearing metal salts or carbonated eclogine, what is the fate of carbonate in those types of rocks? So if you are to the right of these lines, that basically means the thermal structure is hot enough that carbonate will break down in the downgoing slab, meaning CO2 will be coming out to our process. If the temperature is to the left of these lines, that basically will tell you carbonate is present as a solid phase in the downgoing slab, and accordingly CO2 will not be coming out to our process. And what you can see, superimposed on all these lines on this diagram are these dashed lines, which are the thermomechanical models, geodynamic models that are telling us what are the estimates of pressure temperature trajectory that, right, as a function of that in different subduction zones, from Sunda to Northwest Asia. And what you see is, although the subduction zone thermal structure does vary from one subduction zone to another, in more or less all of these subduction zones, PT conditions are cooler compared to the decarbonation or carbonate building So based on that, the broad conclusion we have reached that at least at the present day, in the overall period, carbonate subduction deep into the mantle is likely the norm. Not much carbonates are probably breaking down from the slab and coming up to our process. So that's one point. Now, what about the concept of carbonate subductions if we go back in time? So I talked about uh, present day type of uh, settings where we can estimate, but the idea is if you go back in time, maybe in the Archean or Paleoproterozoic time, the planet likely was hotter. There are many estimates that suggest the mantle potential temperature was maybe 150 to 200 degrees hotter than the ambient mantle today. If that's truly the case, what is the effect of that on the slab surface temperatures of ancient subduction zones? So, of course, now this is where you know, it gets complicated. More uncertainties prevail in our understanding because it's not so easy to just translate an estimated mantle potential temperature to a slab surface temperature. So, what we have done in this particular study um, is do two things. One, apply some sort of secular cooling of the mantle and say, okay, the planet probably warmed up at by as much as 50 to 70 degrees per million a year. It will go back in time, and a fraction of that is reflected in the slab surface temperatures of ancient subduction zones. And if that's the case, subduction zones would be as hot as something like this dashed line. But we could also estimate some, um, uh, some ideas, or we can get some ideas of what the subduction zone was potentially like in terms of thermal structure by looking at the BP estimates of supercrustal rocks that are absolutely dated. So this is again the territory of metallurgical metrology, and, and there are you know, more knowledgeable people about it in the audience here. Uh, so these different uh, colored fields with the numbers written next to them, our numbers are the ages of these rocks, and the PT estimates are suggesting that likely the subtractive slabs in those time periods experienced a thermal gradient that is deeper, like a water geothermal gradient. So if you follow again this type of paths, as you will see in ancient subduction zones, you might be crossing thermal decarbonation and carbonate melting boundaries that you would otherwise have hard time crossing today. So that means in subduction zones of, of this type of time period, you might be able to decarbonate the slab much more efficiently, releasing all that CO2 to hard organism in the ancient process. If you recall one of my previous slides, I was estimating the magnitude of this CO2 flux from the mantle on the order of 10 to 30 grams of carbon per year. However, if I do a forward model now, if I say, okay, if I have some estimates of how much carbon is present in the downgoing slab, all of that is potentially breaking down, 
the flux at that time period just through our population alone can be as high as 74 and 2 grams of carbon. So we can the solid part of the tectonic design processes may be steaming up much more steel in that ancient time period than happened today. Now the question is, is that something that's realistic or are we potentially overestimating? As it turns out that at least in that this type of time period, scientists have already speculated that probably our planet needed a greater dose of greenhouse gases. Why? Because this is the time period where Earth between, I would say, uh, 1.5 to 3.5 billion of years ago, the solar luminosity, the sun, around which our planet is circling, that sun was much dimmer. The luminosity of the sun was lower by 20 to 30 percent. And if you follow what the surface temperature would be like if you make the star dimmer, you would not have liquid water on the surface of our planet. However, we do see evidence of life in this time period of our planet that suggests that there was actually liquid water. So how do we have that? One of these ideas is perhaps the greenhouse gas concentration at the time at that time period was higher. And people did actually speculate that perhaps CO2 was in much greater concentration than it. But what was missing is some sort of a mechanistic way of uh, supposing that yes, indeed, CO2 in the atmosphere at that time period would be higher. So what this study is doing is providing you a framework that yes, our population would supply that excess CO2 that otherwise is like was likely needed to support that liquid water. So I talked about this global arts period where the planet would otherwise freeze in completely and having that uh, excess amount of CO2 in the atmosphere perhaps um, was, was supported by our organism for giving that CO2. But what about other warm periods of our planet in other parts of in other time domains of the universe? In fact, one such important broad warm period is the Cretaceous warm period, where the idea is uh, although there are minor fluctuations that are much sharper, such as PGM and so on, but also the idea is there was a, over a large time period along late Jurassic to Cretaceous, the, probably the planet surface was much warmer. How do we justify that? Like, is, again, did the solid earth play a role in having that uh, warm climate supported by excess CO2 gas? If you recall, I argued that throughout the Mesozoic, the slab decarbonation is probably not likely the cause of sublime CO2 because the slab surface temperatures are cooler. So there is no obvious way for us to argue that, oh, during the Cretaceous, for whatever reason, the slab surface temperature was hotter, right? That doesn't quite make sense. Like, there is no mechanistic way for me to demonstrate that. What we did think, though, that what about some sort of a crustal contribution of CO2 to the gas in this particular time period? So, some sort of a crustal structure. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is, in this time period, it could be, if, if, if we hypothesize or if we demonstrate that there were more uh, subduction zones where the nature of subduction, rather than being intra-oceanic subduction zone, they were continental arc type subduction zones. If there were more continental arcs in this time period of our planet, then there is a possibility of having uh, arboric platforms being present in the upper plane. So, intruding magmas from the mantle ridge may have opportunity to interact with, with arbonics in the upper plane and cause some sort of thermal breakdown or contact metamorphism induced breakdown or even magnetic escalation causing some excess CO2 rising to our body. So in this case, the CO2 is coming to our proteins, but CO2 is not supplied by, by the downwind snap. It's supplied by the breakdown of carbonate in the upper plane. And can we constrain that? So this is where um, my former PhD student, uh, Laura Parker's work came in. So, and when she was working, we kind of collectively worked on this, and we said, and we found evidence that even in the present day, there are some proteins, some hard proteins, such as Etna, Vesuvius, uh, Lyceros in Greece, Merapi in Indonesia, and Pocahontas uh, in Mexico, all of these proteins actually have this particular feature of carbonates in the upper plane, just in, in some organic regions. And in those cases, there is indeed excess CO2 gas that we get in the southern Pacific volcanoes. Uh, 
Um, and in fact, there is evidence from smart assemblies that show evidence of Ulasanai being present which suggests this type of a reaction. Uh, in Merapi, the outgas CO2 compositions are less, um, is more heavy, less light in terms of, in terms of uh, carbon isotope composition, which also suggests that some uh, crust of carbonates are contributing to that CO2 degassing. And in Mokeno such as Etna, we get much higher CO2 flux than we get from any other uh, typical art volcanoes. All of these point to the fact that perhaps these apartment contributions can be very important if you have that type of uh, subducted, not subducted, like undercrusted carbonate platforms in the upper plane, which may interact with higher geothermal gradient and something like that. Uh, so, as I mentioned, this is where Laura's work came in. What Laura did is a series of different types of experiments in the lab. One is a thermal breakdown of carbonates of different purity or composition. So, calcium magnesium ratio varying uh, and tracking at what temperatures in the presence of minor amount of fluid, whether or not carbonates can break down at shallow depths. We, she also looked at um, carbonate assimilation. So, again, experimentally simulating uh, interactions of the salts or andesites, hydrous basalts or hydrous andesites interacting with carbonates and trying to quantify how much carbonate breakdown can take place if you have assimilations like that. And then by studying those experimentally synthesized samples, we could um, constrain what is the extent of assimilation or what is the extent of carbonate breakdown by that type of magma carbonate or fluid carbonate interactions that happen. And relatively low um, so, magma crustal interaction can lead to assimilation, leading to this type of reaction. In that type of reaction, what we found is this type of reaction gets facilitated at higher temperature and lower pressure. So, if we go to the systems that are relatively shallow depths but high temperature, extent of assimilation is more, and accordingly, that produces more gassing liquid and releasing CO2 in the fluid, which will eventually outgas. Um, you can also have processes of Contact metamorphism, which we will say scarnification type of process, scarn generations. In that type of uh, process, our experiments constrain that if the silica content of the magmas are relatively high, or water content of the melt is also relatively high, then more silicic hydrous magmas will cause greater extent of scarnification and again greater release of CO2 in the process. And then there could also be some sort of a thermal decomposition if you have extreme heat, direct kind of soaking type of processes close to the magma bodies. They are also in can have just simple thermal breakdown of carbon releasing CO2. So we constrain through these type of experiments what would be the extent of the gas if you have carbon uh, breakdown in the upper um, plate. Then what we needed to do is calculate what would be the CO2 released by assimilating volcanoes. We can compute that flux if we know the magma feeding rate, if we know the density of magma, if we can uh, estimate that percentage of assimilation of particles constraint from our experiments in the lab. Uh, and then in a, using an equation like this, we can calculate how much excess CO2 outgassing might happen if you have continental arcs, if you have carbonates under thrusted just beneath volcanoes in the upper plane. So we just wanted to do this just for the current day volcano stars, Vesuvius, Etna, Merapi, and Coco. And what we showed is, of course, there will be a positive correlation between the magma flux rate and the extent of excess CO2 gas because of their interaction. And what was uh, interesting about it is we could match the present day flux of Vesuvius CO2 uh, or Etna CO2 emission just by, um, I believe it was Vesuvius, yeah, Vesuvius CO2 emission uh, by our type of model, that experimental uh, simulations of how much harmony breakdown will be taking place and how much CO2 gas will be But what was really Interesting is, of course, what we could constrain from our experiments is the maximum limit of CO2 degassing that you can get by this type of interaction. And what it showed is, if this type of interaction was extremely uh, efficient, just by this crustal carbonate breakdown through thermal input or magnetic input, you can explain as high as 60 to 80 percent of the global heart flux just by this type of. Uh, metamorphic or metamorphic assimilation in these gas. So, which would be huge, but of course we know that's probably not the case happening today because we don't have, you know, as many places where we have magma carbonate interactions going on. But this is where the efficacious warning problem comes with this coming back. What 
my colleagues in TV and uh, some of us working together showed in this uh, paper in 2013, 2015 is perhaps this was a time period where the plate tectonic uh, reconstruction was completely different than that of today. So instead of having lots of island art type of situations, what we had, we had a Pangea where the subduction had taken place all around the supercontinents rather than in between. And accordingly, the the length, extent of uh, subduction length that had continental art type rather than island art type was much bigger. And in fact, we estimated that the so what is the length of arc, how that carried with time, so not only it was continental arc time, but the total arc length around this Cretaceous time period was also perhaps higher. So what we then did in this work by uh, most of colleagues such as Chu working with me and Sinti a few years back, what we could calculate is what would be the extent of not coming from the arts, not coming from inversion increases, but just coming from this upper edge. And what this shows is uh, this lower panel that the carbon output by uh, erosion rate comparison in this gray. So, of course, it's lower than that, but as you can see, in this Cretaceous time period, there may be actually a flare of CO2 outgas taking place only by the upper plate carbon emitting now. So, what we argue based on this is this is again another time period in our planet's history where solid earth may have played a role in providing more CO2 in the atmosphere causing that global drop uh, So let me now turn my attention uh, for the last part of my talk uh, to organic carbon. So, so far I have been focusing on carbonates, so oxidized form of carbon. So carbon is this very interesting element. Um, so I fell in love with this element because it has multiple balance states. It goes all the way from plus 4, so you do carbonates are plus 4 balance state, all the way to minus 4 in this methane. You can be 0, this graphite or that, right? So, so far I have been talking about oxidized form of carbonates or CO2 as What about some organic carbonates that are not like um, calcite secreting organisms that are organic carbon, but things like kerogenes and so on that can also be present in downward settings? Then again, I'm bringing back that same pie chart, and as I'm showing in the crustal portion of the downwind slabs, average globally, organics is a minor component, but it's still there. So the question is, what is the rate of organic carbon as it is going down in the subduction zones? In the present years of subduction zone carbon cycle, we can try to get a sense of what is the contribution of organic carbon, which, by the way, in terms of carbon isotopes, is light carbon. So Hertz sequence ratio, if you look at Hertz uh, sequence ratio of carbonates and organic carbon and so on, the mantle has a minus 5 parts per million carbon. Carbonates are zero, and organic can be, organic carbon can be as light as minus 25 minus 40, so much lighter. So by doing carbon isotope mass balance in arc emissions, so all the CO2 that are coming out to arc with them, uh, the geochemical community have produced this type of mass balance, which suggests that. Carbonates are the dominant contributor of arc CO2 outgassing, and organic carbon today is a relatively minor contributor of that arc gassing. So, in the present day, at least, the organic carbon is not contributing a lot to CO2 outgassing through convergent uh, boundary uh, locations. But the question is, was that truly the case throughout the planet's history? We bring that whole dimension back. Now, in order to understand what is the fate of organic carbon, um, in, especially in ancient subduction zones, when the subduction zones were like in water, we conceived this hypothesis that because the subduction zones were hotter in the past, maybe they would undergo relatively shallow dehydration much more efficiently. We just use the because the thermal gradient is steep, so the slabs will undergo dehydration relatively quickly. So meaning free fluid will not be the main agent that can leach out organic carbon. The agent that can leach out organic carbon will be because slab is hotter, there could be slab melting. So, what is the role of slab melt in breaking down organic carbon and taking it, uh, you know, releasing it to in subduction zone? So, in, in this, another simplification was um, it has been shown that through diagenesis and low grade metamorphism, uh, things like kerogens they undergo a transformation in terms of CH ratio. So the CH ratio of organic carbon uh, diminishes, uh, or sorry, increases through low-grade metamorphism and, and uh, diagenesis, meaning 
uh, although it was starting to be primarily carbon, by the time SLAM reaches some sort of a software processing layer, where the temperature is hot enough to give you micro SLAM melts, organic carbon transforms into some form of nap, that is ordered nap micro or gram. So it's organic carbon with light uh, carbon in them, but the form of it by the time it gets in the hot zone is like that. So the question is, what is the trade of graphite? Now we can simplify the system, we can understand how much graphite dissolution can take place in the hydrostatic melts. So this is where, uh, again, the work of one of my other former students, Megan Duncan, came in. Megan is now a faculty member running her own program at Virginia Tech. Um, but this is kind of her PhD work when she was at Rice with us. Uh, what Megan did in this work is to look at the extent of carbon dissolution both the form of carbon dissolution or the extent of carbon dissolution in a high thrust rhyolitic type of melt shown here, which would be the product of slab melting in the presence of water, and how much carbon can dissolve in it, especially if it is saturated with graphite. So, again, rather than being oxidized form of carbon like CO2 or carbonates, we are now testing saturation with a reduced form of carbon and asking the question how much carbon can dissolve in the melt. What we found in this study is, in comparison to CO2 dissolution in the presence of CO2 or carbonates, if you have graphite, a reduced form of carbon present, the extent of CO2 dissolution in hydrostatic melt is lower, significantly lower. So yes, you can mobilize some carbon from graphite to a hydrostatic melt, but the extent of it is much less. But again, remember, subduction zone was hotter in the past. So although uh, it increases with pressure and increases with temperature, the present day will not be releasing a lot of that organic carbon, but the ancient are still made because it is hotter. Uh, so in order to do that, what we have to do is to utilize our experimental data of CO2 solubility in hydrostatic melts, and we also found out that CO2 can dissolve in hydrostatic melts both as carbonate ions as well as molecular CO2. So we needed to develop a carbon dynamic framework of how the solubility constants for these two types of dissolution reactions change as a function of or vary as a function of pressure, temperature, or oxygen gas, so that we can model the extent of CO2 being pulled from the slab, from organic carbon into the slab melts as a function of cooling of the slab through time. We need slab is hotter earlier, cooler now, but we can model that through time how much organic carbon we can pull by the slab. So that's what this plot is. So the temperature again, uh, T plot, first of all showing the estimated slam, uh, slam surface pressure temperature trajectory 3 million years ago, and now uh, in the water line, so slam pressure zone is cooling. And what we can show is uh, how much CO2 can be mobilized by this organic carbon breakdown and dissolution uh, in the slam mesh will also change through time. It will be more before and less now. Right? But now, with this, we can also model that as a function of time, as a function of slab melting, uh, during the slab melting, how much organic carbon can be pulled out of the slab in some fashion sense. What this shows is, yes, if, if you go really back in time, it's possible to actually to break down all the organic carbon, but if you come sort of like 25 or, or, or uh, younger than that, you can still retain a significant fraction of organic carbon in the slab, because you can't dissolve that by slab melts. So there were, of course, some estimates which you have to, uh, estimates of temperature goes down to time and all of that had to be factored in. So using Megan's work, what we had shown in this uh, work back in 2017 is if we make some estimates of when subduction process started and if that coincided with around 2.5 GA, the subduction of organic carbon may be causally linked to uh, rise of oxygen. And this is where I'm kind of taking a uh, changing gear, so to speak, in my talk. So what is the link between this carbon subduction and oxygen? Uh, so far I have been talking about CO2 only. The idea is this. So our planet has oxygen-rich atmosphere today, but that wasn't the case all along. In fact, very early on, from median time all the way up to 2.5, oxygen level in our planet's atmosphere was very, very low. The major increase in the oxygen abundance of our planet's atmosphere happened at, at around 2.5 billion years ago in this event called Great Oxygenation Age, or GOE, Great Oxygenation. Um, and in, through this Great Oxygenation event, the oxygen level in our planet's atmosphere did not rise to the present day value, 
it rose by several orders of magnitude, but it reached something like 115% of the present level. There was another AOE or new proposed consignation event that brought it to the present level. But there is a lot of debate about this GOE, like what caused this GOE, right? Why did our planet experience this sudden rise of oxygen? Now the major um, existing paradigm for that is it, it is something to do with organic carbon dating. Now, what is the mechanism of organic carbon dating? The idea is even before GOE, there was things like cyanobacteria present on our planet's surface. So life existed. And Somehow, at around 2.5 GA, you have to preferentially vary organic carbon of beta particles. And this is a very simple reaction. This is a photosynthesis reaction. If you open up Facebook, you will find this. CO2 and water uh, making sugar and releasing O2. So, all you need to do, if you vary this organic carbon to deep into the sediments, you will build up oxygen that. Now, the question is if this happened at around 2.5 GA, why did it not happen before? Photosynthetic organisms like cyanobacteria started appearing at the surface of our planet as early as 2 million years. So, why is there a delay for 500 million years for the oxygen to build up? Why was, not, why was there not very a lot of organic carbon before 2.5 GA? Right? So, that's a delay. So, but still, going back to this predominant idea, uh, the idea is if you look at this reaction, what you truly need is increase of this capital FR or upper case FR. Meaning, flux of organic carbon variant has to be. Now, the major idea so far has been this increase because of increase of this lower F, lower case F or, you know, small F or. Meaning, fraction of carbon bearing as organic carbon increased relative to carbon and that led to increase of this. Right? But again, the question is why would that be happening at the point? So, we said, okay, what is there is another issue with this whole idea of organic carbon area at the near surface sedimentary reserves. And that problem is, remember we have been all, arguing all along that the planet may have water in the past, but there is no magnetic activity, hydrothermal activity. So if you vary organic carbon only in the shallow subsurface in sediments, there are different time periods in our planet's history where we also argue that magnetic activity can break down the magnetic <coughs> carbon in like poles or other reservoirs in the surface, leading to emission of methane, sudden burst of methane. So, if we just take the organic carbon in, in planets with hot uh, and low uh, magnetic and hydrothermal activity, we have an opportunity to break this organic carbon down, releasing methane. If I release a reduced gas, then this oxygen buildup will suffer a problem. You can't do that. You can't release. Reduce gas as well as uh, hope for the build up of oxygen. You can't have it both ways, right? So we said, okay, what if instead of just simple billion of organic carbon in the sediments, you can see the idea of subduction of organic carbon, right? The, the, the appeal of that for us was in this case, you can truly isolate subduct like organic carbon deep into the mantle for billions of years without worrying about its release relatively quickly. Uh, so this is where. Uh, the work of my another former student, James Eguchi, came in. But what James wanted to do is to take it to at least one more level. He said, okay, we of course need to explain um, rise of oxygen around GOE by maybe organic carbon subduction. Uh, but there is also this observation that associated with this very oxygenation event, the surface carbonates in our planet also show this positive carbon isotope expression just after the event of GOE, just after 2.5, uh, with five billion, with maybe 100 billion year or so delay after GOE. What this means is uh, carbon is always maintained at a value of around zero, and uh, that suggests that otherwise carbon cycle, well, the deep carbon cycle will be stay the same. But there are a few time periods where the carbon is still can which shot up to a positive value and then again came down to that zero value. So organic carbon refers to LC, increased. Therefore, uh, would, would, would otherwise increase the, this delta frequency of harmony. That is again the standard or convention of that. And uh, of course, organic carbon sequestration leads to build up of oxygen. Again, that's the conventional biogeochemical model of explaining GOE. But we wanted to explain both of these to some other mechanism. Uh, so, again, going back, there is uh, this GOE, which is uh, 
happen sharply at around 2.5 GA. In this case, I'm suggesting the GOE based on uh, mass independent fractionation of sulfur isotopes that went away after GOE that suggested that oxygen built up. But this black part again is this low up in the carbon isotope expression event. You can see there is a time lag behind it. So low up movie doesn't start until after GOE. So that's a thing we need to explain. And it actually, low up movie was primarily driven by that increase of lower case or that should also lead to increase of oxygen in our planet atmosphere by as much as 20 times. But we don't see that. Oxygen low rose by up to 1 to 10 percent of present day. It didn't increase by 20 times. So if not a part, what do we draw GOE and Lomagundi? And is there a causal link between these two events? So we um, conceptualized an idea that it was indeed an increased carbon radial. But increased carbon radial in this case, in our model, is not by preferential radial of organic carbon. It is aided by increased CO2 emission from the solid earth, increased CO2 emission from the nitro of our planet. So increased CO2 emission will drive both increased carbon rate and organic carbon radial because if you put more CO2 into the atmosphere, ocean atmosphere system, there will be deposition of carbonates and organic carbon, both, both will increase. And um, organic carbon radial will cause Induction without any large change in the R. So instead of changing this lower case at R, what we are then suggesting, we are going to change this F to R. Right? It's a simple equation. We can do this by increasing this, but we can also do this by increasing that. So flux of total carbon equation. So the flux of total carbon equation in this case is aided by flux of more CO2 getting out of the land. Now again, is this is this physical? Can this happen? As it turns out that we looked at many geodynamic literature, we suggested that our planet likely underwent a change in the tectonic mode, sort of coinciding with around 2.5 million years ago. Meaning the mode was more like stagnant lift or sluggish lift type of tectonics, meaning there was no divergent boundaries or not much uh, convergent boundaries, but more intermittent type of boundaries before. And after 2.5, most tectonic style of uh, mode start, and the evidence for that comes from looking at sarcom data. If you look at um, uranium data, ages of sarcoms, and you plot that as a function of age, you see the major sarcom production, the, the sarcom production peak, first appear just at around 2.5 years. Meaning prior to that, there is no major sarcom peak, suggesting there is no major continent of cross production. So meaning there is no major subduction zone. Then they have a small amount but not a major amount. So we said, okay, what if this change in the tectonic mode of our planet going from sluggish or stagnant lake to mobile lake caused increased CO2 emissions from prior to 2.5 to after 2.5? Prior to 2.5, there is not enough uh, organic centers, only intraplate, but after 2.5, there is organism and arcs, reduction bridges, and intraplate, there will be more CO2. And then the carbon isotope expression can be driven by fractionation of carbonate and organic carbon in the interior. Remember, I showed you carbonate breakdown is going to be much more efficient in water carbon, but organic carbon is still stable. It's not going to break down. So, increased carbon radial uh, equates increased carbon subduction. Uh, and actually, as it turns out, there is evidence for carbonates coming out in arcs preferentially related to organic carbon. If you look at again the carbon isotope composition of arc emissions today. So the pink band here is showing the carbon isotope value of the background mantle or reduction in bridge emissions. But compared to that, all these symbols, all these names are subduction zones or are volcano CO2 emissions. And as you can see, they are all heavier than this background mantle panel. I just see that it, it is indeed that carbon is coming from the slab that is not However, if you look at diamonds, and especially ecogenic diamonds, meaning diamonds that have included in them crustal type assemblages, suggesting that these carbons are supplied by surficial carbons, surficial uh, carbon and trapping crustal lithologies in them. Many of those diamonds also show light carbon isotope composition, suggesting organic carbon may be feeding diamond production uh, in the land of some of those diamond production because they have light carbon isotope. So there is evidence from diamonds that yes, carbon, uh, organic carbon is indeed subtracting the Furthermore, we also looked at carbon 
natural conditions of present the inter interrupted volcanoes. So, volcanoes in Hawaii, such as Pulau, Kulawi, Lomi, volcanoes in Michigan or Society, these are all interrupted volcanoes. If you look at these interrupted volcanoes, you again, fertilize the conditions. As you can see, these are lighter, right? They are lower than the more pen. So, one of the ways to explain that is perhaps the organic carbon is subtracting deeply into the land going all the way to the formal boundary and only they are returned by two type of activity, by thermal upwelling from the formal boundary. And accordingly, this light carbon supplied by organic carbon is preferentially released at interplay settings rather than at interplay settings or rather than at arms. And in fact, what we needed to do is develop a very simple scheme. Remember, our main objective is to explain GOE, explain global community carbon export extraction, and that I'm related to So, global community extraction happened after 200 or 300 million years after GOE. But the travel distance for a slab going all the way to the base of the mantle and coming back, that transit distance is around 10,000 kilometers with the base speed of around 1 to 10 centimeters per year. So, the total time it will take for that Organic carbon to subtract all the way to the base of the mantle and come back up will be on the order of hundreds of millions of years. Right? However, the carbonates will be returning to the surface reservoirs on the order of only 10 million years. Why? Why? Because the carbonates are coming out to our volcanoes, right? Not to that deep return dust. So, this is the simple model we, we wanted to see. If we subtract both carbonate and, and organic carbon, if carbonates are breaking down preferentially in the arcs coming out to here. Organic carbon is going down all the way to the base of the mantle and returned only to interplate volcanism. Can we explain this time delay between the Mahundi and GOE and explain both of them consistently, as well as uh, build up the So that's what I'm going to show you here. So this is the cartoon to the right that we changed with uh, uh, animation. And I, I was, uh, I'll try to calculate, so these are again the literature data we are trying to match. I will try to calculate whether or not we can quantitatively explain this increase of oxygen in the uh, atmosphere of a planet, as well as explain this carbonized protection. So initially, in before 2.5, the plate, our planet is in a sluggish tectonic or stagnant heat mode. So meaning volcanism is only mostly happening to ocean islands, and accordingly the total CO2 flux is low, total oxygen in the atmosphere is low. But then afterwards, once we switch to that more mobile lead regime, we start subtraction, we start emitting more and more CO2 through hydrogen increases, as well as ours. So as soon as we do that, more CO2 emission leads to more carbonate as well as organic carbon barrier. So total F is going up. If that's going up, oxygen starts to rise in the atmosphere. Now with some time delay, with, see this is taking off only at 2.5, but the buildup of carbonized flow starts with 10 million years of a gap. Why? Because that carbonate is getting deposited on the ocean floor, getting carried all the way to the trench, getting subducted, and eventually getting released here and coming out to us. So there will be some delay. But then, as soon as that carbonate is preferentially coming out, the delta 30 C, 30 C of the surface carbonates will start to increase and will reach that P. And then, after around 300 million years or so, eventually the organic carbon will be returned to interplate volcanism applying the light CO2 into the atmosphere. As soon as the light CO2 is returned to the atmosphere, now this extraction dies again, because now I have supplied again the light carbon into the atmosphere. So the extraction of the carbon isotope can be explained, but nothing changes in the O2 level, because O2 is only provided by organic carbon medium, and that is, that is, that didn't change, right? So with this, we can explain both the GOE and the Loma Lundi event consistently. So the GOE and the Loma Lundi event may result from the Carbonate or, or uh, an organic carbon core. Carbon isotopes of CO2 emissions may vary systematically depending on the tectonic settings we are looking at. And large scale long lived carbon isotope expression can be driven by mantle processes with no change in the air model. So, not just the surface biogenic or geochemical processes, but actually polar uh, process. So, with that, I will give you this summary and several points. So, the main theorem from paradox could potentially be explained by excess uh, degassing of CO2. The present day subtracted carbon activity in these volcanic arcs uh, is limited, but there are different time periods in our practice scheme in the Penal Lake, in particular in the Kibiji 
things where carbonate breakdown um, in the upper plane may have produced excess CO2 in the atmosphere causing warming. Uh, organic carbon subtraction uh, and that behavior two times could be causally linked to oxygen runs in the atmosphere. And geo can be explained. And geo and homology both can be explained by differential subtraction of organic carbon and carbonate into our plants. Uh, manual and the gas in of organic carbon in the organic organics. So these are several of the points I kind of tried to cover. But if you have to leave with one summary take home message, what I would say is if you want to understand long term climate evolution and short term fluctuations of cycles, climate, environment, all of them, it requires understanding of four climate scale processes and their inter interior surface uh, uh, impacts, not just the surface chemistry. So many of us right now are interested or troubled by atmospheric changes and environmental changes. I would argue as an art scientist, you do need all the disciplines to come together to give you a holistic understanding of uh, what's happening in the surface of our planet. You need to think about the engineering process first. So with that, I'll stop. Of course, we have 
more data per second is less data per result because not all that really went to uh, uh, our graph, so to speak. Uh, but we try to interpolate, we try to get estimates for many different traces, like okay, what is the carbon amount and what is also the harmonic compositions of all those carbonates or organic carbons. So that's the input. And then we average it up. So we, we say, okay, this is the concentration, this is the strike length of subduction zone, we know the plate speed, we know the thickness of the crust, thickness of the sediments, we can do the mass balance and, and calculate the plots. That's for the input. For the output, it's all kind of monitoring at the present day. Just by monitoring different art work, you know, we know how much we use now. So of course it's a kind of a present day snapshot, and that's where you know our type of thinking process comes out, comes into give insight going back in time. Because of course we going back in time, we don't have any emission data or we don't have uh, even plates uh, uh, prior to Jurassic, right? So we can only do this that inverse approach only for the present day. Well, sir, I have a question. So, uh, like you mentioned about the plumes, uh, so uh, over time, if we look at the fiber scale perturbations of the geothermal gradients, where does the plume fit in to perturb the carbon cycle on a shorter time frame, that is the shortest, the, the sufficient carbon cycle, and the longer time frame carbon cycle? So, has it been studied or like, is it going to affect our considerations? That, that's a great question. So uh, it has been considered by some studies, especially for large igneous province type of mechanisms, uh, or giving some sort of a short term burst, uh, uh, like things like Tekaman or Pilbara uh, and, and, and so on. Uh, people have considered like uh, a few things. Uh, what has been, um, I'll give you a summary of that, what has been modeled is because those type of plume activities or large igneous province they are very short lived in terms of the span over which the mechanism happens. The dose of CO2 going into the atmosphere, causing warming, and they are dying down is relatively short lived. Uh, it has been considered for surface perturbations in the context of some uh, like PETFF activities uh, or not the broad warming, because what has been shown, if, if it is some sort of a broad warming with increased CO2 predictions in the atmosphere, that is spanning almost 100 million years or more, meaning still not quite here, but the around 100 million years, those leak type of events are not uh, efficient. Like it cannot sustain that. So if it goes up very fast, it dies down also very fast. Too much of the but it has been considered for, for modulating that. Is that my answer? Yeah, yeah. So it has been considered. Um, actually, when we were thinking about this broad cretaceous warming problem a few years back, we did consider the leak and stuff before. Now, rather than doing experiments, we can, because we know how much carbon can dissolve in the salts, if we know again a maximum flux rate for a given leak events, we can calculate how much CO2 gets. We did those calculations and we kind of found similar results as previous traces that yes, it, it can explain it, but then it cannot explain the longevity of it. It goes up quickly and comes down quickly. Uh, but yeah, it, it, that, that, that gets studied. And that, that is more steady than the type like of stuff I talked about. Many, many studies are considered for a sort of mass extinction event or other type of artificial perturbation caused by uh, interplate mechanisms. But interplate meaning not at the scale of just a small plume, but big, big extinction, big events like the yeah. Just a Reactions that we call carburetion reactions. 
where CO2 would react to the only forming of the optics and uh, precipitating uh, magnesite or dolomite. If it involves CPA, it will form dolomite. If it doesn't involve CPA, it will form uh, magnesite and so on. So those reactions are favored if the minerals are more APMT rich rather than crustal minerals. So you, you can, and that's why there is now a big industry for geological carbon sequestration, which you may be familiar with, where we need periodite rocks on the surface of our planet, a lot of it. The reason it's not um, you know, taking off is because we don't have that many periodites on the surface of our planet. We only have it in very special circumstances uh, related to opiolites and so on. And then you have to transport the CO2 and react with the, that rock. So, so that's one of the reasons why hydrometric rock, mantle periodite, tends to have more because those reaction kinetics are favored. Like it's easier to carbonate the mantle periodite than crustal rocks. Now, when you say crustal rocks, of course, granites would be the worst. You can't, there are not enough atomic minerals or CO2 to react to. So that's, that's out. The other reason why your cumulative rocks may have less is. Um, because you are looking at a CO2 solubility in magma is strongly pressure dependent, right? So uh, we are going to circumstance where the magma is rising up, it's less dense, it's rising up towards the surface. It didn't, it's still intrusive, right? It did not come to the surface yet, it's not extrusive. But CO2 solubility is still in saturation because it's so strongly pressure dependent. So CO2 outgassing from the magma will happen, and you may still find that things like acubo in your cumulus because water solubility much less pressure than uh, CO2 is not. So CO2 long gassing will also tend to work out. But if it's the same type of later fluid that time zero cumulates, that is like with steel plant corruption and plant, I think you will still find some particles. You are supposed to. So the salt also can be carbonated. Uh, so in Iceland, people are looking at carbonating the salt for CO2. So that can happen. But I would expect actually, which is consistent with your observation, that uh, the effects will show more carbonates. So for example, I mean, even in our country, we have these beautiful serpentinite slabs. You know, we call them open carbonates. We have these, uh, right? You can see serpentines are these with white veins. Those are all carbonate veins. So it's, it's a similar type of process. Yes. So there is a connection potentially, but 
All I know, there have been arguments on both sides. Anything else? Yes. Sir, so, uh, as you showed that uh, organic carbon or C2 uh, is getting enriched in the mantle by the supply of carbon uh, concentrated in the mantle. Uh, so, do you think uh, is there any other sources of uh, getting enriched? Of by C2 with mantle other than subtracting slab. I thought you were working on that. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, uh, yeah. Um, no, I thought uh, you should give that answer. Uh, that there is this idea I think where he's coming from. He's looking at, if I can say what you are working on. You are trying to work on, in the, in the, he's trying to work on um, carbon exopatulation between metallic melts, or type of metallic melts, and C phase melts. We don't have direct data, so your data will be very welcome. But the data that we do have, between graphite and uh, metallic metal, it suggests that metallic metal will be lighter and graphite will be heavier. So if you go by that, you try to make some domains of the mantle with leak of leakage, leakage of the core material and so on. But based on other elements of the signatures, like iron sterile elements and so on, I don't think we see a lot of evidence. If you are going there, are you personally writing that, that white carbon isotope signatures of diamonds are either sourced from our data, the argument I give, or there have been some arguments that this is some sort of magnetic isotope fractionation in the mantle that causes that white carbon isotope. Again, nothing to do with your core, but I mean, you can read it out, but I would argue it's either, so there, there has been a lot of work by uh, groups at IPCP, here, Cartini, and so on. They, in their ideas, it's mostly dynamic isotope. That causes uh, white carbon isotopes for diamonds. Uh, and some uh, and diamond formation, yeah, it's involving missing and kind of isotope fractionation in that, causing white carbon in that. But the other one is already carbon from the stuff. So I mean, I uh, these are the two primary possibilities. Oxidize it. I will sorry, reduce it somehow. So if you put, if you are putting uh, arsenics or CO2 and you want all gas and methane instead of CO2, there has to be a mantle process that will reduce that carbon. Um, so yeah, that's that's the process. Yeah. 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 Uh, because the present day upper mantle is relatively oxidized. So if you put carbonates uh, down, I think carbon in the oxidized form is actually the same form of carbon in the shallow portion of our mantle. So even if you do do that with a deeper domains where maybe the mantle can be reduced by like approaching transitions or on a lower mantle, you can do that perhaps. But once that methane or mixed fluid or is brought shallower, again it will get oxidized. In terms of the actual outgassing, I think it's hard to have that. But locally within the mantle, there has been report of methane rich fluid associated with diamonds. There are trapped fluid inclusions hidden in some mantle rich that suggest this methane rich fluid. So locally, there are observations of that. But no major outgassing of methane. We, at least throughout the Panerozoic, I think there is no report of methane outgassing. Other than, again, things like the EGM, like that, are there. but that's, that argument has been. Breakdown of flat rate and the sea floor that is maintained. Again, not exactly related to uh, deeper portions of our planet. Yes. In our form of carbon, the uh, Officer, uh, I actually have a question. Sure. Uh, sir, uh, you said that uh, you know, the carbon stability has actually changed over time. Thought about in the community. So, if you put down more carbonates, 
less reduced carbon, you in theory can oxidize the lamp. Right? To oxidize the oxidizer lamp, you always need a redox part. So if you are putting carbon in, you say oxidize the lamp, what is getting oxidized? We typically track that oxidation with an iron. Iron 2 plus iron 3 plus ratio change in natural minerals. Um, there have been some arguments for that, but always remember carbonates, in order for carbonates to act as an oxidizing agent for any other redox sensitive elements, you have to break down carbonates. So if you keep carbonates as carbonates, it's not doing anything to anyone, right? Because that oxidation is staying with it, it's not going to oxidize anything. In order for carbonates to act as an oxidizing agent, you have to break it down, deposit the carbon as graphite or diamond. Now you have oxygen to do its job to oxidize something. So just carbonate subtraction, this is so there has been this conception in the community that oh, because I'm subtracting carbonates, we tax the oxidizing agents. If we can keep carbonates, it's neither an oxidizing agent nor a reducing agent. It's not doing anything, right? It's stable as carbonates. Um, locally, there has been evidence, people have argued that no, I mean that they found carbonate subtraction to correlate with some mangrove ecosystems where they find graphite. And then they say, ah, look, it's carbonate subtraction. That led to some of graphite formation, and then when they measure iron 3 plus iron 2 plus in some of the mangrove silicates associated with that rock, they see higher values, then they have those carbon subtraction somehow caused oxidation of iron in that case. But it's only locally that has been shown. As far as I know, there hasn't been any systematic observation that no iron oxidation is linked to carbon subtraction. From actual edge domain, more argument has been made uh, with sulfur. Sulfate playing a role for oxidation rather than carbonate because sulfate resolution in the fluid is more, uh, is more, uh, is preferred with respect to carbonate. So sulfate can go in and, and oxidize things uh, more so than carbonates. I think there aren't any more questions. So, uh, so thank you, Professor Tarjo, for the wonderful lecture once again. And uh, now I'd uh, like to uh, call upon State Professor Shankar for the Dean of the Faculty of Natural and Environmental Sciences to deliver the book thanks and uh, thank you. Thank you. So very good Thank you, Shankar. Uh, it's a wonderful time.